I'd just like to welcome Peter and Jeff, Peter Reynolds and Jeff Langham, who are going to talk to us about signals, signaling, and various aspects of using them on model railways. Uh, if you want to go ahead, I hope you've all seen the video and we'll take it from there. Good evening, gents. Good evening, Tony. Well, probably the best way to go about this is um, to follow on from the session back in November where we discussed how to lay your signals out. Um, obviously, compression because of you can't possibly, unless you've got huge amounts of area, have uh, signals that are at prototypical distances. So you've got to sort of judge what you are going to, what you're going to have. So um, as I've said in both videos, uh, or three videos now, the railway here is, is compressed. Um, we got an idea, we haven't got an idea of how big it is in, in, in terms of distance, have we? This, it, no. No, we, 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 we've actually never got round to uh, measuring um, how big the railway is. So um, you, you need to be selective and um, you need to have a little bit of a care about where you're going to put stuff. So obviously you can see here, we, these are the platform starters and the shunt signals at Bexhill. There's six signals here. Um, this one's a southern um, signal. It's a southern rail built post. Uh, this one here in the middle, which does platforms uh, three and four are um, southeastern Chatham, um, lower quadrants, and this is an upper quadrant. And the shunt, signals on the on this signal are miniature arms, uh, lower quadrant miniature arms. So you've got all your signals and well not much point having signals if you're not going to make them work. Now indoors here um, the signals operate with servos um, which seems to be the, the common thing to do nowadays. Um, in the past, uh, and we have got one signal in the old shed, which is in the back of us, there is um, one signal that operates with a solenoid, uh, but that that is a bit sort of old hat now. But if it works, it works. Um, all the, yeah, Warrior Square, the signals there are mechanical, uh, and they work using um, fishing wire, uh, fishing trace wire, and uh, fishing weights and pulleys. Um, and the reason for that is obviously outside. Uh, if you want to keep the weather out of your mechanisms and everything as much as possible, um, you want to avoid electrics. Um, Yes, you can seal stuff to a certain extent, and, and we do. We, we, we use um, soup pots, uh, are the, one of the things that we, we have used outside for point motors. Um, you know, the individual portion soup pots, you um, screw the, uh, you yeah. screw, you screw the lid to the baseboard and you cut a hole in the bottom so that any moisture and everything drains out of it. And you can clip it up and it, and it does produce a, a, a reasonable enclosure. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we seal the bottom with duct tape where the leads come out. And we put those desiccant sachets, you know, that you can get. Uh, we put one of those in there just to um, wick up any condensation because as they heat up, um, they, they sort of last forever, but they, they will take, um, take sort of low levels of moisture away. So the signals outside, and you will see, you would have seen, if you've seen the video that I made, you will see the lever frames with the uh, curved tubes, which are the, the lever way for the uh, fishing traces, and they go under the board. And, and 
under the baseboards, you have, it's basically a network of brass pulleys, isn't it? The stuff goes around brass, brass uh, pulleys. Curtain hooks. Yeah, and curtain hooks are used. Um, and we use the coated fishing wire because it, they otherwise, didn't we, didn't we try, we've had a few that were just normal traces, they broke. Didn't yes. They? Yeah. yeah, so you use the coated wire uh, and it provides not very much resistance and uh, it's less prone to abrasion and um, it, uh, it's lasted very well. I mean, in effect, the stuff at Warrior Square, um, Warrior Square used to be the old Bexhill um, before we built the, the building that we're in now. Um, and that's been in existence since the railway opened, 30 plus years now, isn't it? Yeah, my kids weren't born when, well, I think Andrew was one when I first started here. He's now 30 odd and a train driver. So, hey, and that has lasted all this time. We've, we've hardly had any problems with it. it. You do have some little maintenance issues yeah, it's a little in, the main, in the winter time. Yeah. Yeah, in the winter you you do have to use a little bit of there's a little bit of oil. Yeah, in. but it's relatively simple. You just pass from the lever frame the wire. You can use um, some certain types of fishing tackle hooks that will clip onto the levers in the lever frame. Then you go down through the eyelets, run it to the signal, and obviously you then add the weights uh, to the bottom of the signal um, to get a nice return so what you actually do is if you manage to get it right when you pull the lever you take up the slack in the cable just like a real signal and then final quarter quadrant of the frame you pull the lever over and then you'll get the arm going down or up and then um when you let go of the lever out of the, the catch handle flies back in the frame you get a very nice bounce on the signal yeah. which is caused by the fishing weights that you've attached it, it, it is quite effective you do it is once it's set up uh, and it doesn't take a huge amount of work to set it up you can actually get your signals to work very prototypically because yeah. it is the prototype in miniature i mean semaphore signals it, use wires it's and cheap it's and, cheap and it's it is very easy cheap to use to it's excellent for outside you can fit micro switches to the back of your lever frame for any sort of electrical connections yeah. you want to make. But um, under the baseboard, if you've got a lot of track work or wiring, the, we find it quite difficult to use indoors because it just there's just so much stuff in the way of a good straight run. But outside, where the, the layout is simpler, um, then it's easy to run a good, you know, uh, 90 degrees or 45 degree angle. To, to reach the signal without too many wires and baseball joints and other things in the way. Um, yeah, quite effective. It, it is pretty effective. Uh, and just to sort of um, reiterate, again, if you've seen video that I made for this particular program, if you uh, look carefully, you will see some of the pro points are mechanical and they operate using, we use brazing rod, didn't we? Yes. Brazing rod, and uh, we got some etched right angle cranks and T cranks and things like that, and brass uh, hand levers. Um, and we did that mainly because the lever frames otherwise would have been unmanageable in size. And when we, when we changed things around, um, we had to economise to a certain extent because we didn't have the full, um, we couldn't replicate the lever frames, could we? we? We were limited to the number of levers that we could have, couldn't we? Like yeah. Warrior Square, we yeah, couldn't yeah. make every single point work from the lever frame. But it's also interesting, it adds to the operation because you actually, points that would be hand levers on the ground are hand levers on the layout. So you have to move around and, and set your rope route using hand levers um, where it would be appropriate on the ground. Whereas the main line signals and the main line points are controlled by the fishing wire and the rodding. Yeah, from a lever frame. From a lever frame. Moving into 
the old shed, uh, which is in front of us um, and behind the camera, um, and in here to a greater extent, like I said, the signals are operated by servos. The servos, there's nothing special about servos. They're SG90s, uh, which are freely available um, everywhere. The only thing you have to be careful of with SG90s is it is possible to get SG90s that rotate 360 degrees. They're not controlled 360 degrees. They're controlled about 190 degrees to 200 degrees. So slightly more than a semicircle arc. Uh, but it is possible to set them up outside of the range that they will travel. Uh, and they do have a specific part number. And you do have, I, my advice would be, if you're going to go for cheap servos, just be careful about which ones you get. Um, the SG90 is fine. I think we've only, we've, what tends to happen with them is the cables break off where they go into the, servo body uh, through abrasion. Uh, we've had maybe one or two that um, have failed uh, out of goodness knows how many we've used. Well over a hundred, I think. Now, right. The signals you build, of course, um, you are, you really need a mechanism below the baseboard. Now, many people, when they build a signal, um, they attach the servos and the whole kit and caboodle goes into a, a hole in the ground. So say you've got a forearm signal. Uh, once you've done all the rodding down to the base, you then um, will attach all your servo units. And some you can get these commercial ones now where you make the whole uh, unit up. So you might have quite a big footprint. footprint for the signal. Now, because we've got quite a few signals, and I think there's 109, we found that doing it that way doesn't work for us. We, we or I prefer, or we prefer to have quite a small hole through the baseboard uh, with all the mechanism below it, right? So if you're going to do that, you, you need to continue your signaling mechanism below the baseboard. So where your, where your post goes down through the ground, you want your cranks under the baseboard. So the way our signals are designed and built is you've got a base that sits on top of the base with the screws holding it down. And then the signal post comes down and on the signal post at the bottom, you will have cranks. Yeah. yeah. And the servos pull at 90 degrees. So and the servos pull at 90 degrees. So you need to protect your mechanism as it comes down the post and goes through the base. So what you want is to just make a little stop where it goes through a hole in the base. That's so that if there's anything happens to the servo or you're over enthusiastic with its operation, it doesn't destroy the linkage on the actual signal. That stop will make sure that the linkage up to your arms is, is preserved. Below the baseboard, as I say, you've got a couple of cranks. We then mount, we might have these made, these are steel brackets. And all I've done is fitted a bit of softwood to them. Okay. And then I mount on that softwood the screws for the servo. So this is your baseboard. That will be attached to the bottom of the baseboard. Your servos are attached on these. And as you can see, because of the way it's slotted, you can get two servos, one above the other. On the links to the servos, are, I fit Omega loops, and then those Omega loops connect to the cranks on the bottom of the signal base. You set up the, uh, uh, the, the servo with the crank roughly central. If it's on the uh, servo, it's going through 180 degrees. I hope that, that makes sense. So you can probably mount two of these for four, for four uh, signals opposite one another. So one servo, two servos, one servo, two servos, connect them up. You know, you've got to adjust them and, and bend the wires to go through the cranks and all the rest of it. 
Then you manually move the servos with the uh, um, omega loops on them, and you make sure there's no binding, et cetera, et cetera. So then you are set up, signal, signal, um, through the baseboard, servos attached to these brackets, still that side and wood this side, four servos, and you've got your four leads. The clever bit is what Peter's going to describe to you in a minute, is how to program the servos to make sure they only move the amount you want them to move, yeah? So there's, there's a mechanical part to it, and then there's the electronic part, which people, Peter will describe in a minute. Before we go any further, has anybody got any questions about how to make signals work? As far as we've gone. As far so, as we've gone. Just, just before we go there, uh, do you want me to show one of the video clips of the servo in action? Yeah. Yes. Just bear with us while uh, Ian shares his screen. Okay, can you all see this? Yes, that's, that's... I can't. The um, the mouse is not responding. I can't make. I can't move the mouse. Thank you, Ian. There you go. Okay. Right. Did my my cack-handed explanation? Did did that help you with the video and to understand how we connect up the yeah, servo to the? Button. That seems the, to work. Um, so, yes. Yeah. Any, questions? any questions? Yes. Go on. I said, has anybody got any questions about that? Doesn't like appear a, to... that's like a, a big no. No. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. So that's the mechanical side of everything. Um, uh, as I say, you've got two ways of doing it. Do it the way we do it, where we make a small hole through the baseboard and fit the mechanism underneath, mm -hmm. or you can go along to the idea of having the whole unit. <laughs> In, in an assembly, which you then put into and out of the ground. But remember, when you do that, you've got to design in all this with your track layer and your signaling. It's no good uh, having a forearm bracket if you've only got space, a tiny space to get the post in and not enough room either side to make a big area where the footprint is, yeah? Yeah, if you make the signal with the servos attached, obviously the more servos you attach to it. And I'm not saying that you can't get smaller servos than the ones that we use, but if you have a signal with four servos on, it's still going to be quite a large footprint where those servos are. And it's hard to conceal a big hole in your baseboard. And, and if you don't plan it right, you will end up with a hole that could be underneath your track bed and it will destabilize your track bed. Or baseball joint. Or, or at a baseball joint or anything else. So the way that we do it is there's less consideration about how you're gonna fit them. And, and if you've seen the earlier videos of the SR signal group, we've now got virtually all the signals that, that the railway needs. We, we've um, we've got one still to come in here. But you may have noticed that when we um, had the videos in the past, you will see chopsticks sticking up. Now, what these, these are is where we've sighted the signals so we know where the signal is going to be. And what Jeff did was, because um, there's a little flat bit at the top, he wrote what signal number it was on one side and on the other side, he wrote what, how many arms and everything. So we knew how, how big, yeah, we're, 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 yeah. when it was all being planned and laid out, we had a reasonable idea of where the signals were going to go and what footprint they were going to have and how big a space they were going to need. So it's no good putting a signal, even the way that we do it, where there's a baseball join or a baseboard, um, uh, stretcher because you're not going to be able to get your mechanism in uh, in the space. You want to allow the maximum amount of space either method 
for you to work in. You do not want to be working in a, a confined space that makes life hard for you. So you, you want to make sure that you everything is planned as well as the signals you need, the locations planned and where they're going to go and what you're likely to encounter in the sub-baseboard level. And, and that makes life so much easier for you. Now, now for those of you who've got okay. relative, relatively simple layouts, you might well get away with attaching the mechanism to the sig signal post and cutting the square in the baseboard. That's fine when it's simple, but if you've got a quite a congested track layout, then I really do suggest you think about putting the mechanism underneath. Yeah, now, some definitely. of you will say, oh, what about maintenance? I've got to be honest and say, it is, of course, easier to take the signal out with all the mechanism attached after unplugging the wires. But in oh, the last 20 years, I can honestly say I've only ever had to replace the two lots of mechanism. One, because the signal was destroyed or damaged, and the other one was because the, the mechanism became unsoldered. And all you have to do is go under the baseboard, pull the omega loop out of the crank, and, the, and then take the four screws out of the signal, the signal comes out, and the mechanism's still there. And then you just put it all back again, together again. Maintenance of signals above the level is, above the layout level, is usually confined to a drop of silicone oil once a year. Correct. Just to make them work. In it. And not, the, the mechanical bits underneath the base. They don't board, really need lubrication yeah, at all. Because the Omega wires that you use, if you use an Omega wire, acts with the brass crank that you put on and they're self lubricating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gentlemen, if Steve Hull has got a question, what gauge wire do you use? It looked quite thick in the video. Um, the the um, Omega loops were commercially made Omega loops, and they're gem. they're gem Omega loops, and they're 0.9 millimeters wire. So they are quite big, but um, they for some of the uh, locations around the layout. Depending, uh, we have made um, Omega loops, which aren't Omega loops. In fact, they're like concertina shape. And we used, I've used 0.6 millimeter piano wire to make those. But it's, um, it all depends whether you want to either make the Omega loops yourself or you want to buy them. They need to be quite robust because the servos are quite powerful. Yeah. Um, but you do need, need that interface between but, yeah. the servo and the signal. Yeah, you can't yeah. just you you will because the servo doesn't always go back, especially if you're using analog servos. If you want to go to the expense of using digital servos, then by all means, but the price difference is it's an order of magnitude and, and they're, they're a bit of a pain in the ass to drive as well, to be honest. So um, you do need to have a, li a little bit of um, flexibility in your mechanism. Now you can put that flexibility wherever, wherever it suits you. Um, and the way that we do it, it just suits us. But like I said, we don't use these um, these big Omega loops everywhere. We do have a couple of locations where we have concertina-shaped ones made out of um, uh, piano spring steel uh, instead because of the location of where the signals are. Um, Again, we've not quite followed through our own <laughs> through our own mantra, and some of the signals are in quite confined locations and needs must where the devil drives. You have to adapt um, and find the suitable solution for what you've got. So, which, is, which is part of the fun, isn't it? Which, which is part of the fun. It's overcoming a problem. So yeah, yeah. So it's a combination of mechanical and electrical. Yeah. So as I'm um, operating, go on, Tony, it, sorry. Steve. Steve, do you want to unmute if you want to uh, ask any additional questions? 
Yes, thanks. I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. My second question I, I typed before, I think you answered it. So for server control, because I use Megapoints controllers, which are expensive, but one of the advantages is they plug in underneath and you, it's much easier to work. How exactly are you controlling your servos then? Are they, because I was assuming you could adjust the movement on the servo to exactly be the same as the signal, but from what you're saying, you need over travel with the Omega loops. Right. That... Um, our, the way that we don't use Megapoints controllers mainly because like Jeff said, we've got a hundred and yeah. 109 signals. Um, the cost of um, the Megapoints driver, uh, Megapoints controllers from that would be getting on for a thousand pounds. So, um, we, we don't use that. What I've done is, uh, and there was a link to the video in the um, in the preview video, uh, I make my own servo right. drivers um, using pickaxe microprocessors. I can drive up to eight servos at a time from one board. Um, and what I do is the, it's difficult to explain, but, um, the way that the servo works is that it, it counts between one value and another value. You set the servo driver up so that it has a value, a particular value at when it's at rest. That value is a number between 80 and 255 or 225. Don't worry about that. It, that is the way that it works. That, 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 that's the way the servo works. We've lost you guys again. I don't know whether you can hear us, Jeff and Peter, but you've uh, frozen out. I'll mute myself again, just in case I'm the problem. No, it's not you, Steve. Um, while, while they've lost signal, uh, Tim's asked to avoid under baseboard obstructions. Have you ever had to make the servos remote from the signal? Um, no, we haven't actually, Tim. Um, all the servos are virtually directly underneath the signal posts. So there's nothing, there's none that have set, say, six, seven, or eight inches away from a signal just because of the particular location. Um, I'll, I'll ring them and uh, try to. I'll, go I'll, go oh, okay. Thanks very much. I'll leave you with it. Thank you. Bye. It would appear that the laptop has crashed and they're recovering it now, so we're back with us shortly. Sorry about this. These technical difficulties sometimes occur. Well, are, are you going to give us a song and dance routine while we wait, Tony? I'll, I'll just play the guitar, shall I? Yeah, you, go on then. You sing, I'll play the guitar. How's that? Well, <laughs> depends what you play. You wouldn't want me to sing. <laughs> it, well, it depends what you play. <laughs> what do you want me to play? <laughs> Silent Night. Lovely. Well, it, it ought to be the railway train came over the hill and she blew, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Uh, it, while, it, while we're waiting, um, do you want to show us any more? Anybody videos? wasn't involved in the first session that Peter and Jeff did, there was an invitation set out for anybody who may be interested in coming to visit the Garden Railway, the SR7 Mill Group. Um, so probably they'll probably you know, make the same invitation this evening. I know that Steve Other, who is with us, is uh, coming along. Um, and that is currently booked for September the 11th. Now, there are limited numbers that we can accommodate, but if anybody is interested, um, you know, if it's not too far for them to travel, then um, please get in touch with Peter and... Um, let yourself be known. I'm sure that they'll pass this on again, like I say, later at the end of the session. Uh, if you're wanting to do that, you can always email me or Jackie and uh, we'll pass the message on. That's tonykelgog at gmail.com. You, you'll find our links through the Guild website. We don't seem to be getting them back very quick. No. 
Well, the thing is, we can edit this part out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And for anybody who might be excited, uh, I'm doing an evening with on September the 26th. Um, this is Templot part two. So just a bit of promotion for my session in September. Yeah, we'll look forward to that then, because uh, I missed your session the other day. Uh, yeah. I watched the video of it, uh, which was very useful. Yes. Good. Lots of, lots of information on that. It does take a bit of getting used to this Templot, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But, um, it's quite a steep learning curve, but once you've got the, the basics, then you can move on from there, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but just, just going back to signalling at the moment, certainly for the SR7 mill grip layout, um, although there are currently 109, I think it's 109 signal arms, um, not 109 signals in total, because we do have some core light signals, uh, hopefully later this year, towards you know winter, we are going to be redeveloping part of the railway and quite a lot of the signalling there, which is currently semaphore, is going to be replaced with colour light signalling as part of a, um, a re-signalling programme and a, a rebuild of some of the track work. So there will be changes implemented later this year to the railway. Uh, just, just to mention to everybody that uh, John and Christine Walker have mentioned that they have problems outside with servos due to expansion and contraction of control wires, and omega loops successfully take up the variation. So there's a, there is a place for omega loops, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think I, the, the other advantage with them is like Peter mentioned regarding the, the travel, you know, from zero to uh, for 80 from 255 is the omega loop can also add some protection in case, a, in case a servo does go faulty and overdrives. So you've yes. got that added protection in there. I mean, it's not 100% protection, but it will take some of the strain up. And conversely, also, if it's trying to pull too far the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a layout which I use servos to drive the points, and I've got omega loops on each of them just in case, because I don't want to be wrecking the blades and tie bars. Yeah. Because it did. <laughs> you learn about these things, don't you? Are there yeah. any problems getting back in, Tony? Um, I'll, I'll give him another ring. He's, I'll, I'll let them with it. The, uh, I'll give him another ring. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, they can't. They're all muted. <laughs> Um, he's not answering his hello. Hello, this is Peter's phone. I'm not available right now. Hello, Peter. You having problems still? Your, your mouse was right. Uh, you've not got a trackpad. Right. Jeff's got a laptop. Yeah. Um, you've got the scout stream, but no mouse indicator. Yeah. He's, he's struggling with his mouse. Can you not get Jeff's laptop? We're at Jeff's laptop. Making the mouse of Jeff's laptop. Tony, if you mute yourself, I'll do some screen sharing. I will do.
Okay, gents, while we wait for Peter and Jeff to return, I'll, I'll show you some more servos and the signal arms that they drive. So this is one of the signals at Bexhill. And this is the arm that it drives. And this is the signal underneath the one you just saw this is the servo for it and i can't get to the uh, arm at the moment bear with And this is the arm under it is the uh, shunt signal underneath. So you can see there, there's two servos mounted very close, fairly close to each other with the Omega loops, one driving the main signal arm and the other one driving the shunt signal. That's signal nine coming off, and you can see the platform indicator underneath signal nine. That then extinguishes as the arm returns to the horizontal. And then the calling on arm, again, also showing the platform indicator for platform three. And there we have the calling on arm with the route set for platform four. Also, I know the chat's mentioned we've never actually looked at how big the layout or the railway is as a whole concern. But this just gives you I've, I've been working on template to do our very first line setup so i will show the whole railway um so where peter and jeff are sat is in this area here at bexhill in the new shed this is the old shed with great victoria street station one side southwark and bermondsey good yard and station will be this side and then we've got the garage here. So it's, as you can see, even just in this, it's quite a large setup. And where Bexhill originally was outside, up here where this line is at the moment, um, this is what is now being replaced as Warrior Square, which is basically a freight um, area with uh, excursion platforms um, based roughly on, um, is it, um, 
Saint, not St. Leonard's. Can't remember the name of the other station on the coast now between St. Leonard's and Hastings. But uh, once that plan's done, we'll have actually a full plan of the railway for the first time. He's still struggling at the minute. Have they not got Jeff's laptop? While we're waiting, has anybody got any questions that I could possibly answer? Trying Jeff's laptop. Good. Hello, Peter. John Castle. He can't hear you, John. Ah, uh, but can you? I can hear you, yeah. Bill can hear little weed, but Ben can't. <laughs> no problem. I see you're having rather a few problems. Well, they are. We're not. <laughs> you or I aren't having problems. Oh, well, that's all right. My my signaling setup is all um, electromagnets. Yes. So I don't use servos at all. I've never have used them, but I've used old car solenoids to flip them up yeah but uh basically i'm doing the same as what you're doing yeah but it, it's totally different yes i don't need amiga loops or anything i just have a little peg to stop the signal coming too low or going up too high yeah yeah so you use those as your stops for the solenoid don't you uh, yeah, because yeah. um, they're only electromagnets I made myself. Right. So some are stronger than others, so some move slow and some yeah. move a bit quicker. But that's that. But your way of doing things is quite brilliant. Uh, I, 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 will, I must admit, Peter has done a fantastic job in you know, designing and programming what he has done for the signal operation. Um, although he has used, like we, we're using pickaxe, there are commercial boards available for the pickaxe chips. He has actually, you know, made some boards himself for specific locations and for specific functions and features. Um, so it is, it is, it is quite good. It is certainly, I mean, the only issue I have with it is it does end up sometimes a bit of a uh, spider's web in terms of wiring with the amount of wires that's on the railway for. You know the microprocessor controllers and the, um, the the wiring to the servos and the wiring to the point motors because some of the signals won't operate unless the route has been selected. So they the, the microprocessor boards need a confirmation from a signal uh, from a point motor that it has actually gone over the correct way. For, then it allows the servo to be energized to operate the signal. So um, there's, there's an awful lot that goes on with, with the route selection and the way the signals are programmed. So you can't, you can't, for example, if you set a particular route up, you can't pull off the wrong signal because the system, it won't actually do anything. It won't let it pull off. 
because the servo is not getting the right command. And, cons and conversely, um, you can't pull a signal off if the route hasn't been set. Yeah. So it's 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 electrical interlocking, but not to the extent that you would necessarily get on the you know the real railway in terms of you know, signaling. There are some areas, there are some places where you can you know, drive past the signal without having to pull it off, but the ma majority of the signals now actually do perform a function of preventing you from running, or they don't work unless the correct route is set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my signals will only come off if the route is set, but yeah. they're not electrically connected. You can still drive by them, so I'm sort of basic rubbish, tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, Andy Sparks has asked, do you have a video of the manual fishing wire method of signal operation? Uh, I don't actually, Andy, um, mainly because that's now all... Apart, well, apart from two or three signals in Southwark, which are difficult to get under the baseboard to look at, um, I think all the fishing wire control is now outside. Um, and the only way we can actually operate those signals is to take all the covers off. Um, and we've been so busy doing maintenance and getting parts of the railway ready for our operating season this year that we haven't had a chance to do any video outside, unfortunately, as yet. But um, I'm sure we will be looking at doing something for that. Um, Tim, how is the interlocking arranged to ensure points and signals are coordinated? Well, hopefully, Tim, what I was just saying there with John has, has answered that um, to an extent. So um, you set a route um, out of a out of a out of a platform, for example. So if we're coming out, I'll, I'll do this off the top of my head. If we're coming out of platform three. Uh, platform, sorry. Um, but if we're coming out of platform two at Bexhill, um, we don't have to change any points. So that's quite simple. So all you have to do is pull off the signals in the right order, which are 19, 21, and then 23, I think. Um, and then once all those signals are pulled, you can depart. If you don't pull those signals off in the correct order, or if, if you don't pull one off, that end of the platform actually isn't energized. Um, so you, you can't actually drive forward until the correct sig signal switch sequence has been set. If you're then um, driving out of a platform where you have to set a route, and if I, once again, off the top of my head, platform four at Bexhill, I believe is points 13 only, you then have to also then do 19, 21, and 24 two or 25 um to depart from platform four so if 13 isn't set then um the, the signal at the end of platform four the platform starter won't pull off it would just not do anything um 19 and 21 will still pull off because they're actually you know the advanced starter and the outer home um so once once your route is set you can then um, pull off the correct signal and it's the same with the operation at Coolston uh, for the platforms three and four if you're departing platform three to go up the gradient or the incline to Smith Smithfield um, you've only got two signals to pull off which are 26 and 38 um, and same thing you have to pull 26 first and then 38 will pull off if you're going round to Southwark from Coolston Platform 3, you have to do points 15 and 17. There's, uh, one, ad, one provides flanking protection. And you then pull off... I um, can't remember the signal is going out. I can't remember the signal is going out, unfortunately. But the platform starter is 30... Four, I think, off the top of my head. So if 15 and 17 aren't pulled, the correct signal to depart from platform three won't pull off. So that's all done electronically via pickaxe microprocessors that um, Sir Peter has designed and built and written the software for. Thank you. Pleasure, Tim. Thank you. So I can't guarantee those numbers being correct. I'm, I'm trying to 
you know, remember it for myself when I'm sat at, because I normally operate Cools de Ney, which is the, um, the, the the most complex part of the railway in terms of the junctions. And it's just trying to figure out, remember what the, because there's two Trident signals, one, one Trident at the end of Platform 3, one Trident at the end of Platform 4, of course, that's six numbers to try and remember. But it gives a, it gives a, a basis of, you know, what you have to do. Um, there are other routes as well, for example, so you can come out of platform four to go onto the main line to Great Victoria Street, which is points 22, 14, 13, and then that would be the, the, the Trident, the, the signal arm on the Trident for that route would then pull off because that's the route that you've set. So the interlocking, in fact, is in the programming of the software, really? It is, yes, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's so once, once, once the once the uh, once the pickaxe recognizes the signals that it gets from the point motor switches, it will know. It, you know, it, it then gets the information of what points have been pulled and what the route is. It will then only allow you to pull off the correct signal. So the point motors have all got detection. So uh, yeah. the system knows when they're at full travel. Yes. Yes. Thanks. My pleasure. Uh, just to let everybody know that uh, it would seem that Peter's laptop has died, which is why they've gone offline. They are trying to get Jeff's up and running, but Jeff didn't have the Zoom link and doesn't have Zoom on his laptop. So I've sent him the link and hopefully they'll get that going. And uh, worst case scenario, they're going to try doing it by mobile phone. But we just need to give them a little while to get yeah. uh, get working. Well, I mean, the, he won't need. He won't have to have Zoom on the laptop anyway, will he? No, he, he won't. That's what I've, I've emailed him the link. Yeah, as long oh. as he's got the link, he'll be okay. He doesn't need to have the Zoom itself. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. Excellent. So, Thanks, Tony. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll see, and, and thank you for uh, keeping it going because I know nothing at all about this layout. Uh, it does sound very exciting. Well, I, I'm sorry, like I just said to Tim, I am doing it off the top of my head in terms of trying to remember some of the numbers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So apologies if they're wrong. I, you know, I know the points are correct. It's the, some of the signals might be wrong because they say there are so many. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and when you've got when you've got uh, you know signals in, at one station having numbers that are similar to signals at another station, it's like uh, which ones are they? Yeah. Well, clearly Peter is a, a professional signal engineer working for the, uh, the railway network and he's introduced a lot of the professional signaling ideas into uh, into this layout hasn't he yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't say he's an engineer or oh, I, I shouldn't have said that that's, that's in the video now isn't it he's a he's, he's a yeah he's a uh, senior yeah. signalman at um, new cross as far as I'm concerned, that's an engineer. Yeah. Technician, then. How does that sound? Technician, yeah, because he sits there with a multitude of screens and a trackball. You know. <laughs> well, I saw his video that he did. And it, 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 yes, it's very good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, was, uh, it looked very complicated. I don't think I could do it. Could you show the layout again to see the oh. extent of the railway in seven, railway from Tim? Is that the uh, template plan? Template yeah. Plan? Yes, go ahead if you can. So this is it. This is as far as I've got so far with it. No, let's get. So the majority of this that you can see is everything that was part of what we called Plan Y when we redeveloped the railway. Um, so everything at the, this this area is all to do with the new shed and the loop lines and the main lines that run around and then come back into the shed. Um, so what so sort of radii are those curves? Sorry, Tony. What sort of radii are those curves? Um, minimum radius, I think, is six foot one inch on these on this curve. Uh huh. So 
So we haven't gone. We haven't. We've. I managed to get the planning and designed in a way that we didn't have anything less than a six foot radius curve. Mm -hmm. I take it the uh, the four lines that are going horizontally across in the middle where this cursor is now. Yeah. Two centre lines descending downwards. Then. Yes. So um, any of you that have seen some of the videos, and there's a couple of my videos with my ATF doing a you know a big freight train. Um, these two lines in the middle actually are descending all they, they start to descend about here. So they're dropping down all the way down the side of the old shed and then start to level out here where they go under the two lines that go into Bexhill. The three lines that come out of Southwark, Bermondsey here in the old shed this side and they come round and join the lines from um, Smithfield which are also on a gradient, they're coming down and inclined there, and they carry on on the level underneath those lines, underneath the GVS main lines, and then they start to rise. So you've got a steeper gradient here, and they meet um, the main lines at Coolston, this junction. So this stage from Bexhill, this is basically a, a, a redevelopment of the one that when it was originally outside. And um, what we did, we took the opportunity to expand it to four platforms which was the original plan for Bexhill West although they only ever implemented two platforms um, so we've kind of like gone to the the full size of the station as it would have been if it had been expanded to its fullest extent so what are your gradients oh they vary I mean um the gradient on the loop lines here is about one in a hundred, uh, but coming up the other side, I think it's about one in seventy-eight from memory. Um, the not sure about the gradient up to Smithfield. Um, it's not it's not particularly steep, but because it's rising all the time and then on, on quite a tight curve, it does get a bit you know a bit naughty at the top here. Uh, mm -hmm. for trains um, as an example a, a quite heavily weighted schools class 440 will only pull four coaches up here mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just the way it is um, the gradient from Coolston here up to what is no warrior square is is quite steep I reckon that's about one in 62 maybe a little bit steeper but uh, not we've not been able to actually cite that one probably because on this section, if you can see my mouse, on this section up here, there is the gentleman's facilities that the railway passes through. Right. <laughs> so it's a bit difficult to do a sighting of the of the actual gradient. Down at the bottom of the drawing, is that a line going over the where the cursor is? is that yes. So this these are the Smithfield lines here, and they go over the top of the Great Victoria Street station approach. Right. It just looks as if it's the other way on. It looks as though the, the outer loop goes over the top of the uh, inner one, as it were. Yeah, it, it, it looks like it goes under because it's the only way I could do it. If I'd have done it, if I'd have inverted the sleepers, then I'd have lost all the sleeping through the uh, oh, scissors crossover. Right. But this this layout is of, the, of Great Victoria Street station approaches and the engine shed area is what we're going to do later this year this is the new plan all right uh, let's say i'm still working on doing the overall uh railway in template which we say we've never had an overall plan of the whole railway so the smithfield which is over here in the garage which is uh, appeared on a couple of the videos um I've, I've yet to line out and then this side is where um so that good yard and bourbonsey platform is for those of you that have seen the um little milk depot that's on the carousel on the guild forum or the guild homepage, that is located in this area in this top corner here mm -hmm. so how many people does it take to operate this layout then Mitch? um on a, as a minimum, as a minimum, if we don't operate Warrior Square, just because it's outside, um, we can get away with one, two, three, four, 
five, six, six eight people. Mm -hmm. still, um, still a fair few people. Well, it's des it's actually designed to accommodate almost twenty people. Crikey. Because there's been provision for a signalman and a driver at each location. So if Smithfield had two, Great Victoria Street had two, if Southwark had two, that's six straight away. And you've got two for Coolston A, two for Coolston C, that's 10. Two for Bexhill, 12. One for Bexhill Goods Yard, 13. One for Bexhill Engine Shed, 14. One for Coolston Coal Concentration Depot, 15. And then another three outside for Warrior Square. Uh, and then there's still provision for a, a separate engine shed operator at Great Victoria Street as well. I'm new. That's it. Can you hear us now? Yes. Oh, yes. All the way. Maximum, maximum, maximum 22 operators. There you go. Excellent. Minimum six. Well, depending yeah. upon how, how much we run age, Jeff. <laughs> depending yeah. on what we do or don't operate. Right, you're back on spotlight. Welcome back. Yeah. I, I filled in on your behalf. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. For right. Yeah, um, I, uh, with regards to the IT problems, I refer everyone to my um, my byline on the forum, uh, my forum signature. I've forgotten in, enough about computer engineering to last two lifetimes, and it number two sum fix it for me. So, oh, excellent. Good, <laughs> Good job. Of it. Yeah. Right. Robin, can you um, make that full screen? So I think we lost you guys when you were talking about... It's the, it's the, that's it, yeah. We, we lost you guys just as you were, I think, about to start talking about um, pickaxes, wasn't it? Right. Okay, so what I was talking about before, what what we have is um, I you can use pickaxe microcontrollers, which um, I've done a special interest group about, and there is video available on YouTube for it. I did it for the show back in uh, 20, 2021, I think, and. Um, what it is, is, these are little 8-bit microcontrollers that come in various sizes, and they are meant for school projects. And what they are, they are microchip picks, which are you normally program with C through an interpreter. But what they've done is they've put a little bootstrap program on them, which means you can program them in BASIC. So to drive a servo, you have uh, various commands, um, but the main command that you use is a command called servo pause, or one word, S-E-R-V-O-P-O-S. And what you do with that is you count up. So the, the servo, full scale deflection on the servo is roughly between 80 and 225. So if you do servo pos 80 and then follow it with servo pos 225, the, the um, horn will go round through its maximum amount of trouble, travel. So what you do is you put a delay in the numbers. So you fix where the, the servo is at rest. And like Jeff said, he sets them up so they're roughly in the middle of the travel. So I've got a little bit of a a ballpark to work from for starting number. And then what you do is you, you do a pause between each step and that makes the arm move slower or quicker. And um, obviously what, what I do with an upper quadrant is the arm will go up slowly because it's acting against gravity. So the um, interval between each step that the servo moves is long. And then when it comes down, uh, I make the interval shorter. In fact, I make the servo count up in ones, but when it goes back, it counts back in twos. So it goes back twice as fast as it goes up. And obviously for lower quadrants, 
I make the numbers go the other way around. If you look at the link for where I did it for the show, it shows you all about um, how you do it. And uh, you can see, you don't need to, it is really quite simple. You know, you don't need to be some mega computer scientist to actually understand it. To make a servo go one way and then go the other way, it's only about eight lines. It's, um, it's not a huge amount. What is quite clever, I think, um, is the way that I talk to the servo controllers. And you will have seen again in the video, uh, there are the, con the big controllers which are on boards underneath the baseboard. And they speak to the servo controllers all over the place using a serial line, a serial command. And what I do is those controllers send a serial character down one wire and the servo driver at the other end reacts to the character. So if you have a servo driver that's driving three signals, you call the signals A, B and C. What it will do is when you pull the relevant lever for lever A or whatever the number is, it will send an ASCII character. Again, you don't really have to worry about that, but it's a number uh, between 00, zero and um, 255. It sends the character down the serial line and at the other end, the servo driver is waiting for that character to arrive. And when that character arrive, arrives, it goes, oh, uh, I've received an A, so I've got to go and do a uh, signal, whatever it is, the first signal on that servo driver. And, and it will go and do it. To put the signal back, all the servo drivers, they either send a letter Z or a letter Y down the serial line. Uh, and if you have a servo driver that has multiple arms on it, it writes into the memory on the servo driver what signal has been used. So obviously, if you've got a, a servo driver that does three signals, you can't have all three off at the same time. So if it's signal two, it will know that it's signal two. And when it receives a Z, it will go, ah, oh, right, signal two is the one that is off. That's the one I've got to put back to danger. Uh, and that's how it works. The reason that it works like that is because there is quite some quite big distances between the lever frames and the signals. Um, where I'm sitting now, uh, this um, block of flats conceals Bexhill's lever frame. And the advanced starter for Bexhill is what? 10 feet away, 10, 12 feet away? More like 15. Yeah, it's 10, 12, 15 feet away from where I'm sitting. Now, if you use like the mega points type thing, you have to be extraordinarily careful about where you route the switching wires because what will happen is if you route them near any wires where you've got a traction supply and if you have dirty pickups or you have a motor that's got warm brushes in it or whatever, anything like that, that causes an RF signal and it's near the... Um, switching signal for, for something like a mega points controller, it will affect the, it will pick it up and you will get false signals. I found that if I use serial command uh, and one wire, and I, I've had to add ferrites around some of the traction wires where they're bundled together. I mean, we use some, um, we use 2402 wire and, and 1602 wire for our, uh, to make the trains go because it's all DC. Um, and we've got clip on ferrites, which you, which you, can, uh, you can get. And we put those around the bunches of traction wires and that cuts down the interference. But 
the way that I do it is all because of the distance. If you've not got the distance or you've got um, a layout where everything is straight, where you can um, route things well away from each other, you, you won't necessarily need to do this. Um, and I, I've just recently made um, a Merg servo driver, which works similarly to the um, Megapoint system, um, but was a fraction of the cost. Uh, and that works the same way. And that's pretty effective as well. But I am not going to use that where there are lots, lots of traction wires. But that, that's the way that it works. I explained it all in, in the video. I start off with a spreadsheet uh, and all the signals and points are interlocked. The points are detected via the tortoise point motors. Um, and in effect, they provide isolation and they force the operators to set the signals. Because again, like I said in the video, there's no point spending time planning researching, fitting, making signals, if you're not going to use them, absolutely no point. You might as well just do away with them altogether if you're not going to use them. We've got 109 signals and it's arranged so that you last have time. to use them. The last time we counted. Well, the last time we counted, yeah. So it's all set up so you actually have to use them. I've got to say that once, once the signals are set, the program set so you know i'll be looking at the signal and peter will be on his laptop incrementally increasing the throw of the arm up, it works. up goes the o up goes the arm he sets it by pressing his computer keypad it's set and then it it and never then, changes and then i save it so on my laptop um and i have saved it elsewhere notwithstanding it problems earlier but they are saved elsewhere. I have all the individual settings for every signal that has this kind of servo driver. Yeah. So if something goes wrong and nothing has gone wrong, touch wood so far, uh, I can go back. If, in, if the throw needs adjusting, all the question, all it is, is you just go in and adjust. You just change two numbers. That's all you need to do. It's very reliable. It, it is pretty reliable. Um, and um, it, it does work quite well. We had a big running session today, four hours. With Barry Walls. Yeah, yeah. with Barry Walls. Mid Anglia Group. Mid Anglia Group, with no signal problems whatsoever. Excellent. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> I've killed you all with science. I'm sorry. <laughs> while while you were away um, sorting out your IT problems, I I went through some of the video clips for those that were still with us, just to you know keep something happening. Um, so I showed um, signal signals the two signals at uh, Bexhill that we videoed the other week, Jeff uh, H and K. Right. Um, so obviously, one is the signal arm, and one's the uh, shunt signal. Do you want to discuss how they work? Because obviously they're not done via a lever frame, are they? Which ones are these? H H signals H and K. Oh yeah, these, yeah, the, the, what, these ones. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they. Although they don't work on the lever frame, they work on switches underneath, don't they? Yeah. Yes. So the point of what, what this is all about is when the main station was laid out in. Uh, you know, 1903 or whenever it was, um, it's all mechanically worked from the box. But this line here, which has got the conductor rail on it, this is a line that was added in the 1920s by the Southern and electrified. In theory. Um, so in theory. So what we've done is we've added a subframe. So you've got full size levers in the, in the frame, but there's a subframe, yeah, which is a bit like the Westinghouse, a, a, a3, is it? A2 frame? No, that, an A2 frame is standard. Oh, the, frame. What's the, what's the L? L frame. An L frame. So the, when the Southern modernised the signal box uh, or, and added this line, they added a subsidiary frame, which they often did in the box, to work the new layout, which is an addition to the original layout. 
So the switches, they're just throw switches, but they work the this part of the layout with the signals J and K. So the main frame is is uh, the normal, you know, one to whatever, and the uh, and the subframe is lettered A to K, uh, which then works these um, uh, signals on the electrified lines. Um, Philip, number two son who fixed my laptop, he, he bought me a book for Father's Day last week. And um, that is all about the electrified, uh, the program of electrification for the Southern. And I haven't told Jeff this, but in the book, it goes through the plans that uh, the Southern Railway had for Bexhill West and the Hastings line. It, it was due to be electrified in 1939 and it was put on the back burner because of the war. Right. It was completely, uh, there's all the dry diagrams in there with all where the, all the substations, track paralleling uh, cabinets and, huts, and, and huts and everything were. So what we've done with this bit of Bexhill is basically we've said that the war didn't intervene or they did it earlier than they did and um, we have the subsidiary frame. I might add that the subsidiary frame, the electrical work frame, the L, is a, in the model of the signal yeah, box the model, that we've got yeah. here. You've got the full frame for, for the mechanical, but there's a subsidiary model of the subsidiary frame in with the track frame. diagram inside the signal box. So, yeah. it, you know, the, signal, the model of the signal box mirrors what we've actually got on the lever frame. So... Going back to methods of operation, there's a lever frame here. Um, there's one uh, over there, which is caused in C. There's one up the other end of the room, which is caused in A, which is the biggest one. There's four, that's 40 levers. Um, and this one also works a ground frame, yeah, doesn't it? This, this one, there's a ground frame associated with this. Um, next to the laptop over there, there is the panel for the goods yard. Um, which has only got one signal, which isn't installed yet, but it's an interesting one when it will, does get installed. It's not far off. But over there at Causton C, which is just out of view, there is, we have got a genuine NX. All right, it's a Western region one. You can't have everything, but it is a genuine NX. The tiles that make up the NX are older than I am. They came from Reading and Slough, and old Oak, some of them came from Old Oak Common. It's got 118 24 volt bulbs in. You can warm the shed almost with it <laughs> when it when it runs. It's got 24 volt bulbs in because um, 12 volt bulbs, which were an option, weren't an option when the supplier said that he wanted a minimum order of 60,000 at 60 p each. So um, that was a little bit beyond our budget. Yeah. Um, but the NX over there, that operates much the same as an NX would on the real railway, except the Western region ones, you turn the entry switch and you press the exit button. Um, and that operates the points. It, it also, operates the signals using a similar method to what I said. Um, the NX controller, which is in a 19 inch rack case, sends out a letter, which is easier over there because the signals are lettered. So for A, it sends an A, B, it sends a B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you cancel the route at the moment um, manually, it sends a signal back to danger it's got self-normalizing points for a couple of the routes as well. And that's all written in to the programs using these meant for education. So for children, pickaxe controllers. Um, and like I said, I did a special interest group uh, and that is available on, on the YouTube channel and via the website if you are interested. Um, and if you want to take the plunge, it is surprisingly not difficult. It is meant, from kid, meant for kids and they are relatively cheap. Each of the servo drivers that I mentioned are on the grounds of cost, um, a four channel servo driver 
excluding the servos costs four pounds. So basically excluding the servos, it's a pound an arm. Peter, Tim, um, Tim Stubbs has asked, could you describe the lever frames? Apart from the ones operated by you know, operating fishing wires, are the frames all similar? Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. they are. The frames, the lever frames are based on a design by Epsom and Newell Model Railway Club. And they are, I think I paid tribute in the last video to a gentleman, a member there who I saw yesterday, Mike Ball, Mike Ball. who's an S&T man from the Southern. He and his club members came up with a lever frame, which is which is first rate. Um, extraordinarily which, robust. Yeah, very robust. They've got catch handles and blocks. Um, they move for a very nice quadrant. Um, you can't buy them. Obviously, they're handmade. We will um, show you sometime what they look like. Um, oh, if I tell you so that hopefully at the end of the year, uh, towards November, we're going to make a comprehensive film of the whole railway. Um, uh, and it will be presented in the November virtual show. Yeah, it'll, it, a lot of people have asked about all the different stations and where they all are. It's quite difficult. So one of the reasons Ian's making this quite comprehensive diagram is that we will be able to show you the whole railway. We'll then be able to div subdivide it into each of the stations and show you the diagram, the track layout, signaling diagrams and what we would do is we'll focus in on each station and film without the trains moving the signaling the lever frames and all the other bits which been, might be useful yeah. and i would add that at the end of the video tonight i will be extending an invitation which i previously did in the first show to visit the railway for all of you people who are interested in signaling and have followed these two uh, films that we've made. Uh, and I'll announce a date and you can come if you want to and actually see how it all works. It yeah, if you reply to Jackie and, and, and yeah. the thing, uh, and the date, the, the date, that we're, date that we're looking at is after Stafford. Um, and um, you can apply to Jackie and um, if you can, if you can make it, um, you can come and visit by all means. If you can't make it on the date that um, is that we've that we've set ourselves, then we will see if we can accommodate you. If not, um, it, yeah. next year. But yeah. uh, generally speaking, we will. There are, is an invite uh, available to Gage Old Guild members to come and see the railway see how it works, see how it operates. So um, so there were a number of people who put their names down after yeah. the first show last year. Um, they submitted their names to Jackie. Um, we're quite happy to make those people uh, part of the group of 20, uh, which we uh, in invite you all to come along on Sunday, Sunday the 11th of so September. September. Uh, uh, Submit your names to Jackie with your guild numbers, the first 20 people, priority being given to the people who ask first, of course. First 20 people are uh, more than welcome to come here and we'll split you up into groups and show you what you want to see. It's far easier for you to come here and see this. We are in London, I know, but come and see it and understand what's under the baseboard, what's on top of the baseboard, how we go about deciding where the signals go, what the lever frames look like, Hopefully you'll go away with a few ideas. Going back to what Tim said, the lever frames um, uh, are identical. Um, the, the only difference really is in their physical size. So the largest one is, of course, you know, down the far end of the room. That's 40 levers. The one I'm sitting in front of, but, uh, um, one which is, we haven't got, I don't think we have got one. Um, um, hold on a minute. Just going to go and have a look in the stores to see if we've got I, a bit. I, of, I've been looking for a photo on my laptop of one. I haven't got one on my laptop. Yeah, so this conceals Bexhill's um, frame, which is 25. The, the ground frame down by the, by the station building is three. Um, and where they are not mechanical, so like Jeff explained with the, uh, the fishing trace wire, 
we use micro switches. So um, these ones have got quite large micro switches on with big levers. The one in Smithfield in the garage uses a very, very small micro switches. I, I got um, back in my old job, I disassembled a load of um, disk drives, RA disk drives, and each one had uh, a lid uh, micro switch in it. Um, and I basically got a bag of micro switches, about 60 of them, uh, and they're still in use. They, they work fine, but they are the small ones. They're only about that big. But the ones behind here are huge. They're, they're, the levers are like that. And the tails of the levers operate on the micro switches. I'm uh, sorry to say. We haven't got one. I'm sorry to say we haven't got one made up. But we they come in blocks of... They were made by a, a member here based on the Epsom and Yule design. And he used um, the construction of these lever frames as a project uh, using a CNC machine. Yes, yeah, the very early CNC machine. Yeah. Um, so they come in quadrants of three, I think. Three and ten. Yeah. What you do is you make up a frame, you and know, by adding to it, and then um, you bolt it all together, and then you add all your switches and all the rest of it. Um, and then you've got a number of plates on the front. Unfortunately, I can't, you know, without... A picture of one, I can't actually yeah, show we you. Can't, we can't really show you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anything else you want any, to know? Any, any other questions? Challenge. You mentioned about the Jeff's electric. You mentioned about these pickaxe controllers, and yes. you did a video. I, I, I watched the video. Do, the actual um, circuit board that you put it on is that a proprietary circuit board that you, you used, or what? Yeah, it's a proprietary circuit board. That the board, um, the boards, the board, the kit. For the board, you have to, I mean, you don't have to be a brilliant solder, um, you know, brilliant assembler to do it. Um, the board, you get everything but the pickaxe in the board, in the in the bag with the board. So you get all the components and you get the download socket and everything else. That's 199. And you, you can get them from other sources even cheaper than that. And the pickaxe is well, they've gone up a bit in price, um, so that they're two ninety nine. They used to be one. They used to be one pound fifty, but they're two ninety nine now. All, all microchips have gone up, but um, I bought a load when when they were cheap, um, and I've still got a stock of about twenty of the smallest eight pin ones, um, and just for for spares. So the boards the boards are very cheap. Um, and I did mention that in the, there is another company that um, that I use, which you can get to through Amazon and eBay. They make the boards, um, they make other boards as well, and they, they are very cheap. Um, they're meant for kids, so, you know, um, it's, um, it is proprietary, but it is inex inexpensive. When I was looking at the pickaxe boards, there's several different ones, isn't there? Yeah, there's um, there's actually um, let me think one, two, three, four, five, six. There's basically seven different types, um, and they go they go from the eight pin one, which is in the video up to the 40 pin one, which I use for doing the interlocking controllers. The only real difference, well, there, there's a few difference, few differences, but the only real difference is the number of input and output lines. So the small ones have six um, input and output lines, and the big ones have 33. Um, 
Uh, obviously, the bigger ones have more memory um, and more variables, and they can work slightly faster. But um, the program is common, so you can take a program off the eight pin one and run it on a forty pin one with um, with no alteration to it whatsoever. Um, all you have to do is set it up on the laptop. The software is free. Um, the only other thing that you need to buy is uh, the download cable. So, and you only need to buy that once. You can actually get, um, you can get starter kits, which will give you uh, a board to an experiment with various components, a pickaxe microcontroller and the download cable. And that costs about 20 pounds. Anyone else? Notice Alex has put on the uh, on the uh, on the chat box the pickaxe.com details so that if anybody wants to have a look at the website. Um, yeah, well, Alex came to the uh, special interest group and and um, was involved in that, and um, I, there were a few people on there who had electronics experience and I seem to have um, stimulated them into possibly trying out what I do rather than um, using more complex methods but um, I, it's hard for me to say it, it, I find it, it no, I've, I've got 21 ex years experience working on computers, okay, before I became a signalman. So um, I, I know what makes them tick and everything else like that. Uh, I, I can program or I could program in six or seven computer languages. But basic is the one that if you're around my age, which is sort of late 50s, early 60s, you are likely to come across in school when you were in school, if you did technology in school, at, um, sort of like early secondary level. Uh, and it was just, uh, if you had, let's say, for example, you had a ZX80 or a ZX81 way back in goodness knows when, that it is the same language that you would have used with those. Um, it's mature technology and, and what they've done is they've repackaged it for the, for the start of the 21st century. And it is so easy. You do not have to go away and, and learn Unix or anything else like that to program in C. It is intuitive and uh, I know I, it may sound, oh, well, he's got all this experience and everything and it's easy for him, but it really isn't that difficult to get into um, once, you, once you start off. And the beauty of it is, is, like I said, the software is free. So you can download the software if you've got a computer. You can download the software for nothing. You don't have to buy anything. And you can write a program and you can test that program on that free software. So if you don't like it, you can go, oh, well, I don't like it, but it hasn't cost you anything. If you want to develop, think, oh, well, maybe this has got possibilities and everything, then you can go the step further, but the cost is zero to start off with. Um, and I, I can't, I've got no connection with them, but I've got, I can't recommend it any more than I have done. Peter and yes. Jeff, I'm going to screen share because I've managed to find this while you've been chatting about pickaxes. All oh, right. Yes. So that is... Um, Coulston C. That's Coulston C frame when... <laughs> oh, that's a long <laughs> oh, while ago. Look at that. Yeah, that was before anything else was installed <laughs> around it. So that's what the lever frame looks like. Um, the switch down the far end is for illum that illum that's illumination. So 
there's a cold cathode tube in the um, in the bulge below, which shines up. So if we turn the lights out, um, it will illuminate the lever frame from below. Um, there is also a switch down this end now, which remotely turns all the power on. Uh, and the, the box in the background, which you can see, that controls the um, coal. that controls the coal yard. So the two point two, um, you've got isolating switches below, and the two switches above control the points. But in between the two now is the is the NX case Panel. in that in that gap is the NX it sits there. It sits on a credenza and it's got all the wire and everything. But that's when we were um, building just. Yeah, it doesn't look like that now. Oh my god! Do you remember that? So thing? hopefully, hopefully in November, when we refilm the railway, you'll be able to see what it looks yeah. like now. Do you remember that green carpet? Yeah, the green carpet. <laughs> the green yeah. carpet. One other, one other thing, chaps. Um, I showed the uh, the rest of the um, gentlemen joining us this evening. The um, Oh dear, oh, no. sorry about that. I'm trying to share a different screen again. One of the um, signals nine and ten that. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the ones that caused them. Yeah. Yes. So I showed this clip. So could you explain how the indicator box works? Right. So this um, uh, this signal. Uh, it, it's basically um, um, three signals that you can see, but it applies to five possible routes. So the signal that you can see, the lower one on the, on the left, that applies around the link line to Bexhill, which is the shortcut without going outside. The other two arms are nine and 11. Uh, the top one is nine and the calling on arm is 11. What it does is this, this is all part of the detection. So what you have there, you see where it's, so it's off and it shows a three. Well, what it's done, it's detected the points and it knows that the point is set off the down electric or down Smithfield into platform three. What it's done is the controller has sent the character to do that. And the servo driver also drives the route indicator box. So it, um, all it's got to do is display a three and a four. If you think about how a seven segment display is laid out, there is not an awful lot of difference between a three and a four. I think it's only three segments of different so um, what happens is that the servo driver also has the capability of driving the number. The calling on arm actually works properly like a calling on, uh, like a calling on arm would. So the train is approaching the signal uh, and what would happen is the signalman would pull the calling on arm when the train is almost at the signal and virtually at a standard walking pace. Well, what I've done with that is I've fitted a, um, an infrared detector about two thirds of a carriage length in rear of the signal. So that when you pull that number 11, nothing happens until the train comes along. It sends the character when you pull the, um, when you pull the lever and Nothing happens until the train reaches the infrared detector, which is just slightly in advance of the signal. When it hits that, it goes, oh, right, the train is there. And then it does the calling on arm with a three or a four, depending on which way the route is set. So what I've done there is it's simulated. It's not like the real thing, but it increases the realism of the way that it looks. Yeah. So that is really the upshot of a lot of the signals on this railway. It's simulated because it makes the railway look better. 
and it makes and it's and it's true for the operation of the yeah, railway. It's true for the operation I mean, of the, the railway. If yeah. there's a train occupying the platform when you want to draw, join two electric trains together, you have to call on the second train. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that's what that is. If you if you're running through the book route, which is the taller of the two arms, then you, and you don't need the call on, you don't get a platform number because the, if the, you the driver the platform. Yeah, yeah, because it's the book platform. The driver knows he's only gonna go in number four platform. But if he's being called on to either platform, then you get three or yeah, four. You get three or four. And and both the platforms Again, they're behind me. Uh, we will explain in the, in the main video. In, in effect, the the platforms three and four at Causton are split into two, um, and the Causton A signaler ha has or controller has two switches, and he can control who has control over those two platforms. But they are in effect divided in half. So the Causton C signaler. Signalman controller has one pair of micro switches, uh, sorry, isolation switches for the bit down his end, and calls the A guide down the far end in the little cubby hole. He has a pair for his end, so you can run not simultaneously, obviously, but you can run two trains into those two platforms from opposite directions. It's laid out electrically specifically to do that. Um, and the signalling is laid out down at the course and A end to do that. Down this end, course and C, they would do the moves either first or second. There's no, well, there are calling on, there are calling on discs out of the, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, out of the engine sidings, carriage sidings, uh, yeah. carriage sidings, but they are, they're not train operated. You, you have to select the correct lever, and that is visual. Yeah, that's to call one a train out of the carriage sidings to join another train to in the do, platform. Yeah, so you so, can join two 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 car electric units. The, the move that we do a lot, we have a two null and we have a push pull set or a, a two, a two H. H, and the two H or the push pull set goes to either Bexhill or Warrior Square, so it goes that way, and then the two null or a two bill will go that way. It will go to uh, Summit, which is in the the old shed, uh, and so, and and you can do that. You can you can send trains in opposite directions. Uh, it well, just increases yeah. the operational complexity. It does. It just makes it more fun. Yeah. You know, when you're in the timetable, the trains join together or they split, or yeah. uh, just like the Southern did. Yeah. So this is they a part do. of what, what in the original uh, video we're talking about. Understand about your uh, what traffic you want to use. And what, yeah. what trains you're going to run, how you're going to run it. All right, so we've chosen, you know, London and the southeast, the south coast, the, the suburbia of London, because we like the intense operation of the electric trains and steam trains and, and freight and parcels and all the rest of it. And we have different timetables for, you know, night time, Saturdays, weekends, uh, rush hours, uh, all sorts of things. And, and yeah. that way you can make the railway eternally interesting because you can select a different timetable uh we're using the same stock run it in different ways uh not bother splitting trains or not bother dividing them um uh, you know to your heart's content all all dependent on how many people you've got here to operate it or or not as the case may be yeah so if you've got operators coming out your ears you know if you've got 15 to 20 operators then you can do lots of intensive things but the railway is set up and signaled correctly for um reasonably intensive operators like how many people did we have today we had 11 yeah, 11 or 12 I think. yeah we had 11 or 12 today and we run in four hours we ran probably about 60 trains in four hours so um yeah, you can you can run you can run a lot of trains. This bit behind me, you can have um, five trains on go. Course and A, you can have six. This this bit down here, you can have uh, you can have four. Um, in and it's DC, so uh, and it's all signaled to cater yes, for that. It's, it's DC, yeah. And it's DC. It's not DCC. We can't no. possibly do 
So when we have train describers, we're developing yeah. train describers, yeah, okay. as you know, yeah. the Southern had train describers. At the moment, we use what's called three five working, which is um, telephone block. Telephone block, which is basically um, track circuit block, uh, yeah. degraded. Yeah. But we're developing. Peter's developing train describers, so you'll be able to describe the train onto the next box and send a simplified bell code. Uh, up on the train describer or come the description of the train we acknowledge that um this is all as again this again this is another sort of southern thing where the, the intensity of the service was you had a rotary block train describer and you know you might have had four lines and you had to describe on the trains to the next block otherwise there would be terrible confusion so yeah that's what we're yeah. going to go towards in the future but uh, that's under development. And, and we are going to have one section of, um, in effect, absolute block, but it's single track. We were going to have no signal and token, but um, it's a bit yeah. difficult to lay that out for on a model railway. So we're going to have um, absolute block from course and sea up to Borrow Square. Um, we've got, I've got, I've made some block bells, again, using pickaxes. Um, because you can do strange things with them, you can make them drive um, MP3 players. So you record your bell, put it on an SD card, and you get an SD card reader, tiny little thing about that big, and your pickaxe talks to it, and it makes bells, it makes authentic bell sounds. Well, the train describers so, are going to be on? To train describers are probably going to be on um, using Raspberry Pis. On a little small yeah, screen. Yeah, on a little small screen. Well, gentlemen, it's yeah. now ten to ten. Yeah. So, like I said, Jeff said we use we've got a we've got an eight line telephone exchange um, in it's in the old shed, uh, and that's how we communicate. Uh, it is it is three five working that that we do, which is uh, is track circuit block regulation three point five. Anything else anyone wants to know? Well, I'd like to say thank you to both of you for a very interesting and entertaining session. And I know we've had some technical difficulties. Um, before you go, I'd like to show a few, share a few slides with you uh, in relation to uh, next month's, um, if I can get it up, next month's uh, thing. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. Can everybody see that? I've got a black. Oh, yeah, I can see that. OK. I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, what you've been doing tonight. Uh, next month, we've got, if I can get it up. <laughs> Hello? Come on. You've got my problem. It's infectious. There we are. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Next month, we've got Nick Dunhill, who's sketch building a locomotive upgrade. And booking will start as of midnight tonight. You'll be able to uh, log on to the website just after midnight and book for next, the next session. Again, it'll be on the 26th of July. You can also go onto the website now and buy advance tickets for the Guildex at Stafford, which is on the 3rd and 4th of September. Uh, hope to see you there. Hooray! I didn't manage to make Doncaster this year, but I will certainly be on the team that will be running Stafford. Um, now, normally would have uh, mentioned to non-members that are here about try before you buy and joining the guild, but there isn't any non-members with us this evening, I understand. But everybody here is a member. So I'd just like to say thank you once again. Um, and we'll see you again on Tuesday, the 22nd, the 26th of July at 2000 BST. Now, unless anybody's got any final questions, I'll just stop sharing that. Is there anybody got any final questions for Jeff or Peter? No, just thank them for a bloody good show. There we go. Thank you. That's all right, John. Our oh, pleasure. <laughs> And don't forget, don't forget, if you want to come and visit us, uh, speak to Jackie, 
Give her your guild number, yeah. and it is on Sunday, the 11th, the 11th of September. September. If you can't make that day, I'm sure we can cope with something next year. Yeah, or we, we can make we can make arrangements. And and once again, all I can apologise is for the IT problems a bit earlier. What happened was my laptop decided that it was going to do an update while we started this, and uh, it just basically threw a wobbler. <laughs> um, it did a, it did an unscheduled update uh, and just went wrong. Um, all I can do is apologise. <laughs> we won't do it at Stafford in the middle of the AGM. Uh, okay. No apology necessary. Well, we I've got to apologise. We did what we could, and Ian did a tremendous job. At well, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Uh, my pleasure, chaps. Yeah. And uh, from Andy Sparks, thanks for an informative evening. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, and, and once again, if you are interested in the way that the signals operate with servos, the way that we've done it, see the videos on the, um, on the YouTube channel for the um, servo driver video, which is about 30 odd minutes, where I'm going to complete depth about how it's programmed and how it's built and have a look at the Pickaxe Special Interest Group, where I run through, um, it's basically an introduction to Pickaxe. And remember, there is no initial cost. If you just want to try it out, it's free. And if you want to see more of the railway, we hope that in November, yeah. there'll be a film which will show you everything and answer a few more questions. And I took a lot of video today and, I, and I, uh, I'll be making a video uh, of what uh, what happened today where I was operating and that will be available next week. And that, uh, two and more that, messages, uh, one from Tim Stubbs, very useful, thank you, Tim. So that's, that's, thank you to- Well, you I've got to say something to Mr Stubbs because Mr Stubbs wrote an article in the Gazette about using Merg, Toti 2 modules, and I've actually bought 22 of them now. So, uh, <laughs> if I see you at Stafford, Mr. Stubbs, I've, your name is on something. <laughs> oh dear, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you will be. <laughs> 22 of them I've made so far. Yeah, they they weren't too difficult to make, I must say. No, they're not. I've actually modified ours to um, so that they carry ten amps rather than three. But oh. um, no, you're right. You can't. I, I can't buy the components for. I mean, the price of um, comparator chips. They're selling them on Amazon for like fifteen quid for five. <laughs> the Toti modules, where you you get two. They're like a tenor for, for everything else. I mean, they're, they're just this stuff. Oh. So I posted a video I've got outside. I've installed a laser detector to cut the track off. Someone said, oh, that's a bit elaborate, isn't it? Until I, I turned around and said, well, it only costs £2.39. And uh, he said, oh, I'll, I'll be, buy a few at that price, he goes. So, um, yeah, Merg, Merg. They're Merg are well worth if you if you want electronic devices. Their servo driver that I mentioned earlier, that's uh, £5.24 to do four servos. So yeah, you can't I can't be good answer that price. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of more messages. Bob Gilmore, thanks, chaps, and well done to Ian for filling the gap. Um, well, my pleasure, Bob. Okay. Um, Robin C to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Another great session. Thank you. It's been our pleasure. And I just hope that um, by our little efforts, people can get as much joy enjoyment out of the railway as we have. And seriously, if you are interested in seeing how it works and how it operates uh, and everything, bear in mind the 11th of September. If you can't make that date, we'll see what we can do. And if you want to either contact Jackie or me, uh, contact Jackie or Tony, uh, and they will forward the details to Jeff. Certainly will, yes. And those that have already booked, um, we've got a list of those, and uh, you will be first on the list. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Our pleasure.
Thank you, guys. Uh, any any last minute no. questions? Any questions anymore? No. Okay, then in that case, I'd like to thank you all for coming in tonight. Uh, it's been great and it's very been instructive uh, and there's been some very useful uh, feedback. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye.